Tish's assignment to heart, as well as Sue, which is to really get to know one another. Um, I'm honored uh, to be here today on behalf of Northrop Grumman to share in this opportunity to partner with INSA for today's event. It's really important, as we've already discussed thus far, for an ongoing, much needed discussion about diversity and inclusion in the intelligence community. I'm here today because it's personal and we're committed as a company. A uh, little bit because it was asked about personal. My father was my inspiration, career government executive intelligence community, and never allowed me to feel I was different. So he was my inspiration. I have two daughters who are coming up in STEM. And what I'm shocked to see is still, is still how big the gap is. So my joy is to give back both to the community and within the company to all that are following, but also to continue to learn every single day. As others have said so eloquent, eloquently today, diversity is not just a balanced gender mix. It is also about creating that well-rounded workforce with varied perspectives, backgrounds, and cognitive styles. That's ever so much important today as we are in increasingly complex technological landscape. Diversity of thought and problem solving is now required. Um, so this panel today, I'm very excited uh, to be part of introducing. Uh, it's why we remain committed to building strong teams, individuals, and diverse personal and educational background at Northrop Grumman. With that in mind, our next panel is STEM and the liberal arts, what it takes in the intelligence community, during which we'll hear how liberal arts and STEM graduates alike have been able to grow rewarding careers in the new IC. I'm pleased to introduce our panel moderator, Dr. Cameron Ward-Hunt, manager at Guidehouse LLP. Cameron leads the Colorado National Security Practice team for Guidehouse. In his role, he advises clients on strategy, storytelling, and management cohesion. In keeping with the panel's focus, Cameron came to the IC with a degree in religious studies and mysticism. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cameron Ward Hunt. Thank you, uh, thank you for that introduction. I always love it when my degree is read aloud. Um, <laughs> makes, makes all four years worth it. Um, to the panelists, thank you so much for joining me on stage. So I'm pleased to welcome Maisha Glover, Senior Advisor from McKenzie & Company. Uh, Rachel Barnhill, Federal Program Manager from the National Nuclear Security Administration. It's Leslie Ireland, who's on the INSA Financial Threats Council and uh, board member for Citigroup. And Mish Tish Long, who is INSA Chairman and my former boss. <laughs> Won't get awkward. Um, so this panel builds on the previous panel by looking at intellectual diversity in the intelligence community. As many careers demonstrated, my included, uh, the challenges of the new IC really require a plurality of skills and educational backgrounds. Uh, blending poli-sci and Russian majors together with double E's, uh, space nerds, and MBAs to all put us together in this one big soup. And yes, even making room for uh, people with backgrounds in religious studies and mysticism, or attempted theater mm -hmm. minors, so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> so, um, we're gonna get started not by having anyone introduce themselves with a bio, but by telling a story, and we're gonna start with their origin story. So, in a couple of minutes, answer the question, how did you begin a career in intelligence and national security? And uh, we'll start with Maisha on the end. Okay, so, um, I remember being a GS-12 at the CIA, and here I had had the opportunity to kind of start off as a GS-5, step six. Yes, back then they, they hired very, very, very early and very low, and worked my way up leveraging my liberal arts degree as a, a GS-12, and then 9-11 happened, boof. Mm -hmm. And so here I had taken these very methodical, logical steps of what I thought my career was going to look like. This hierarchical move, you know, you move here, you get this GS, you get this GS scale. And 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden I was told that I was going to be a terrorism expert. 
that wasn't what I went to school for. That wasn't what I thought I was going to do. But it was a group of individuals that saw a mission need and looked at my career, looked at my skill sets, looked at my liberal arts degree, and said, we believe that you can have impact and fulfill this mission. We believe that you can help us with this need. And so we would like you to take this role and lead this cell. You see, that was a defining moment for my career within the IC. Because what I learned right there as a GS-12, working, had worked my way up, was that others could see a need and an impact. How come I couldn't? Why was I waiting for the opportunity to come to me? Why was I waiting for the next GS grade? Why wouldn't I just hone my skills, find my passion, and then create that opportunity? A few years later, I left the agency and reached out to an industrial contractor, SAIC at the time. And I saw a job wreck. And it wasn't the wreck that I wanted. It was the opportunity to interview. And I never did this before. I built up the intestinal fortitude. I reached out to the recruiter and said, I saw this wreck. But this isn't the role I really want, but I would like to interview with the, the hiring manager. And I said, what I would like to do is, is to show you the impact that I can give to this mission. Because here, there's an industrial contractor that is serving the CIA. And I believe that I have a passion, the skill sets, and the academic career to fill a need, to have a mission. Fast forward, and I continue to do that throughout my career. A year later, just a year ago, I did the same thing with McKinsey. Here is a global management consulting firm. They didn't have a role for someone like me. They did work in the industry. I reached out. I did exactly the same thing. I see what you're doing in the industry. I see what the impact that you're having in mission. I believe there is a need. You have a gap. And let me come in and speak with you about how my passion, my desires, my career, and my liberal arts background can fill that need. You see, what I realize is that I look at things not just in silos. There isn't a STEM in liberal arts. The new IC, if we look at it like a Venn diagram, there's opportunity right there in the intersection, right? That's where the opportunity exists. That's where the creativity is. That's where we're going to make the impact in the new IC. And kind of that's what I did. I believe it's very important for women right there, that kind of that intersection there, and even more so for women of color where we are underrepresented within the IC. And so I've kind of looked at that opportunity space to kind of create what I would like to do in terms of mission. Three challenges that I, uh, there are multiple challenges, but three things that I would say in terms of leaving with you would be one, define your passion and really, really focus on the impact that you can have. Two, no more status quo. Be creative in that opportunity space. Don't think of things as silos. And then number three, Remember that whatever journey you take, and let me tell you, I have taken a journey. I see the North Point, but I have taken this journey. But remember that the journey isn't yours. There's somebody that you should impact. It could be a person, it could be people, it could be mission, it can be an organization. But make sure that you understand the journey is not yours and to always help someone else. Great, thanks. Rachel? First, good morning, and thank you, Insa, for having me here today on this exciting panel. My name is Rachel Barnhill. I am the Chief of Microelectronics Research Development and Weapons Integration at the National Nuclear Security Administration Office of Defense Programs. So my origin story, <laughs> I knew I wanted to contribute to national security by the time I was eight years old. I grew up in a household that didn't believe in traditional vacations. Rather, my parents, who were long affiliated with Doctors Without Borders, we would once a year uh, pack trunks of medical supplies, over-the-counter drugs, old eyeglasses, and we would fly to some of the most remote corners of the world, set up makeshift camps, offer health care to those who could not afford and did not otherwise have a means to get it themselves. I spent my summers growing up in Venezuela, Paraguay, the Republic of the Congo, and each place I visited reinforced the same thought in my mind, that the government of these countries was not a reflection of the people. Great power politics, economic competition, and Westphalian principles were all driving government behavior. And I thought that maybe, just maybe, by taking one of these political bargaining chips off the table, governments would pay more attention to their population and become a voice for the people. So I studied political science and international relations at UCLA to better understand this dichotomy. And it was there that I found my passion, my calling for nuclear policy. 
I then decided to learn what exactly comprises sound policy and pursued a master's in public policy from George Mason University while working concurrently at the Department of Homeland Security. My job there was to implement policy prescriptions within the US chemical sector shortly after the tragic West Texas fertilizer plant explosion. I traveled the country hosting listening sessions where hundreds voiced their opinions. I read and responded to over 73,000 letters DHS alone received over the incident. And I facilitated a working group to draft policy. Ultimately, I was a member of a small interagency team of liberal arts trained individuals that successfully drafted an executive order to improve chemical facility safety and security across the private sector. I thought we had won, that this was major. But I learned that throughout this experience, policy is just one step in an editor process to affect change. Oftentimes, policy on its own, its own is not a stabilizer. Action or the appearance thereof is also required. Unfortunately, though, mired by a lack of insight from the technical community about what it would take to actually change regulatory practices, what chemical downblending, alternate chemicals, and mixture percentages would increase safety at chemical plants, the implementation of the executive order was stymied, and I was forced to chalk up my first attempt to enact change on the national level to a learning experience. Well, I've taken this lesson with me to the National Nuclear Security Administration, where I've ensured that, where appropriate, policy prescriptions are coupled with technological research and development, much like that center part of the Venn diagram you were talking about, which meant that in order for me, a political scientist, to make informed research decisions, I had to shift gears from my pure liberal arts education and begin immersing myself into niche disciplines of engineering and physics. I learned on the job. Fortunately, my teachers and mentors are some of the nation's foremost experts in quantum mechanics, fluid dynamics, radiation transport, and so on. But relying on their technical expertise while becoming informally cross-trained and maintaining a pulse on the geopolitical climate has allowed me to make impactful decisions and inch toward the goal of my eight-year-old self to take that nuclear bargaining chip off the table. Okay. Thanks. Pleasant. So my path towards the intelligence community started when I was nine years old watching television. I'm not quite as precocious as Rachel is, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was July 20th, 1969. And I know some of you in this room uh, know very well what I'm talking about. It was late that night, so that was unusual, sitting around the television in your pajamas with your parents watching TV. But we were watching the moon landing and we were watching Neil Armstrong make history. What I didn't understand as I'm sitting there watching, I didn't understand the look of intensity on my father's face. I'd never really seen that before. But that look of intensity was there because he was on the team that developed the guidance software for the lunar module. So if you want to talk about make or break, knowing if what you've worked on really works, uh, there's nothing quite like doing that when it's on national intel television and when there are lives on the line. But I never knew what he did until afterwards. And I couldn't know what he did until afterwards because we were in the race with the Soviet Union. It was a bipolar world. I am very much a child of the Cold War. And that really is what drove me into intelligence. I studied Russian language in high school. I continued in college. I got a graduate degree uh, from Georgetown University in Russian studies. And what really seemed to be, to me, to be the most likely or the most uh, logical move forward was the intelligence community. So I started with the CIA in 1985. Um, and I spent a year working, uh, actually doing a training program across the agency before I actually ended up at my desk. And I was hired, ironically, as a liberal arts major, I was hired into an office um, that did scientific and weapons research. And when I got to the door, and my branch chief sat me down, and they had originally hired me to do research into Soviet Star Wars technology. So, the space-based defense initiative. And he gave me the opportunity to change tracks a little bit and to uh, focus on what was called third world ballistic missile development. OK, so this flaming liberal arts <laughs> major uh, became a ballistic missile development analyst. And I will tell you that that decision was uh, career changing and life changing for me, because I ended up focusing on the Middle East by the time Saddam had invaded Kuwait, I had been following Iraq's ballistic missile program 
for four years. It was a tremendously exciting time to see something go from development to operation. And it gave me that interest in the Middle East. And my mother told me at one point, she said, you know, after the war was over, you said to me, the next country to watch is Iran, which I did uh, for the rest of my career. And it uh, led me finally to be the Assistant Secretary of Intelligence at Treasury. It's a very circuitous, circuitous <laughs> route, but I'd be happy to explain that to you if you, if you wanted to know at some point um, <laughs> offline. Um, but I will uh, fast forward that to say that I left the intelligence community in November of 2016. I never left a sense of mission behind. Uh, that was very important to me in driving what I did in retirement. I am on the board of directors of Citigroup, and I do that because I firmly believe the health and resiliency of the financial sector is a matter of national security. And that being there, helping them understand bad actors who want to exploit the bank, cybersecurity issues is really an important part. And to finally bring it full circle, I'm interviewing with the chairman of Citigroup, he says to me, do you consider yourself financially literate? Now, that's a fair question for someone who's never been in the corporate world coming out of government. He said, I mean, can you, can you read an income sheet? Can you read a balance, you know, balance sheet? Can you read an income statement? He said, it's not rocket science, but it's boring. And I said, <laughs> I should let you know, <laughs> my first job, I was a ballistic missile development analyst. So I kind of do understand rocket science. <laughs> and I think I can get this. <laughs> Tish. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my origin story. Well, let's go back to the beginning. I'm one of eight children, five boys, three girls, so there was diversity in the family. Uh, I learned from an early age that if you wanted something, you needed to stand up for yourself, you needed to speak up. That included food at the dinner table. <laughs> um, I'm number six in the birth order, but there's a three-year gap. Uh, my, mother, my mother was a saint. <laughs> Eight kids in 12 years. Wow. Um, there's a three-year gap between my older brother and me, so I'm the oldest of the three little ones. <laughs> so I kind of have that middle, order, middle birth order characteristics as well as oldest child characteristics. I was a little confused growing up. Um, not really. I loved math and science. Uh, always did. And I loved the theater. I acted from, an, from a young age. I took French lessons from a young age. I excelled in English. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in, in further questions down the road. Um, my parents were both public servants. They both worked at NSA. Actually, they started with Army Signals Agency and then National Security Agency. Three of my brothers were career National Security Agency. It's one of the few places in the intelligence community I've never worked. Wanted to make my own way. Went off to Virginia Tech to get a degree in electrical engineering. Um, less than 10% of the engineering students at the time were women. I'm happy to say it's approaching 20% today, but still not what it should be uh, across this wonderful nation of ours. Um, so having five brothers growing up in that family, I think prepared me well going off to uh, engineering school. I put my, myself through school. That was one of the deals. I could go anywhere I wanted as long as I paid for it. So the way I did that is I co-opt, and I co-opt with the Navy. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the program, five years for a four-year degree. You go to school your first year and your last year. You take three years for your sophomore and junior years because you're rotating, working, and, and going to school. <clears throat> and then I hired on uh, with, it was the David Taylor Research Center um, when I graduated. And I was building acoustic intelligence collection systems for submarines. How cool is that? I got to crawl around submarines, pulling cables, crawling around the sonar dome in Charleston, South Carolina in about 100 degree <laughs> in a weather. Um, there weren't women on submarines then. So again, 
five brothers, engineering school, working for a Navy lab. I was the only woman in my group. Um, it just never seemed to be a problem. Maybe it was that acting side of me that, that helped out. Um, and I did that for about six years. I actually got tired of crawling around submarines, uh, although I had a lot of fun building those systems, doing a lot of hands-on engineering work. I was ready for the next step, which was really program management. I moved into the Naval Intelligence Command and ended up being the boss of my former boss's boss, <laughs> because I was now the program sponsor of sending money back to the Navy lab. No, not an issue and actually a, a lot of fun. From there, I moved into the policy world and really um, then started moving around the intelligence community. DIA, CIA, back to Naval Intelligence, OSD, back to DIA. And I was very fortunate to culminate my career as the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, where I was very fortunate to work with Cameron. That's how we got to know one another. Um, and, and, and just a tremendous opportunity along the way. I did try to minor in the theater at Virginia Tech. Let me tell you, when you're an engineering student, there's no time for anything. I tried out for one production, had a minor <laughs> role in the chorus, and actually had to drop out because I never made it to practice because I was, or rehearsals, because I was always in the library studying. But I've always been a big believer in that balance between STEM and the liberal arts, or STEAM, as I like to say. <laughs> it takes all of us to make this wonderful community work. It takes all of us to make this nation of ours work. And it takes all of us to make this world work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Rachel first and Maisha. Um, there are sometimes stereotypes about STEM and liberal arts majors, say it ain't so. How have perceptions of your degree affected your career? So I'll start. As a young professional in a STEM organization, I'm consistently asked the same question after meeting distinguished scientists. Rachel, what's your background? And my gut screams, this is a trap. I just had a successful and productive meeting with this person. And my response to this one question, confessing that I am a liberal arts major, will forever change their opinion of me. <laughs> I eventually come to terms and admit that I am policy trained, but have been steeped in the technical for years. And sure enough, I watch as their eyes, once beaming with keen interest, begin to cast judgment. Now, it's true that the soft skills afforded to liberal arts majors and the hard skills afforded to STEM majors provide different advantages. Being liberal arts majors, we go beyond problem solving and key in on the how and the why. And being formally trained to have that wide lens perspective to examine context, the global, political, economic, social underpinnings of a problem or situation is extremely valuable. However, education extends beyond the classroom. Oftentimes, we prematurely dismiss the ability to be influenced and guided by other activities and experiences. For me, this is an immersion into microelectronics. My informal on-the-job training to go a mile deep in that particular technical area should be equally valued as my formal education. Unfortunately, though, most continue to view education as a bimodal distribution. You're either STEM or you're liberal arts. And that may be true for formal training, but rarely do we go through life without exposure to the other side. I found that largely this is a false characterization for individuals in national security to be either or, as we've heard the panelists speak about today so far. However, changing that perception, that stereotype, requires a considerable cultural shift. So I remember my first um, job outside of uh, the government, outside of CIA. And um, you know, I told my management then I wanted to shadow. I didn't want to just convert and just go back into the government. And so I wanted to shadow him, learn the business side, et cetera. And so after about a year or two, I felt pretty confident. And so I found my passion at that time, which was business development. And so now, kind of leading um, a small team within the organization, doing business development, um, a proposal comes up. And it's this very, very complex effort, reverse engineering, the questions about kernels. The only kernels I know are about popcorn kernels. And it was like <laughs> detailed, like very, very <clears throat> complex. And I felt overwhelmed. I'm like, 
am I really supposed to be here? You see, for me, the stereotypes and the perceptions weren't external. The challenges weren't coming from external. It wasn't someone looking down at me, wondering if I could do the role. Clearly, they gave me the role. They gave me the position. It was the self-doubt. It was the second guessing. It was the, can I do this? Should I be here? How am I going to do this? It took me getting that intestinal fortitude to be able to say, there's group think. I know how to pull people together. I know someone, Mike over here, knows about kernels, so let me bring him. What I do know how to do is I've honed my skills on converting these very high, complex thoughts into very simple words that an evaluator can evaluate. What I do know how to do is to bring teams together. You see, I took a different approach, but it still kind of feeds into my first point about creativity. It's not about trying to do everything and mimicking someone else. It's about finding your own place and doing what Nike says and just do it. Right? And that's what I did. So the stereotypes for me, they continue to come up. Those self-doubts, those perceptions, do I really have the skill set? It happened when I joined McKinsey. Everyone knows McKinsey. Everyone has Harvard degrees, Princeton, Yale. Here I was going to knock on the door and say, I want you to create a role for me. Right? Come on. But they did, because I honed my skills on something that there is a need and a mission impact. So my, my thing that I can share with you is sometimes the perceptions and the stereotypes aren't external. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're right here. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Leslie and Tish, different question for you. Thinking about the superpowers you got from your education, what's the hidden superpower you got? Hmm. So I think I'd say, um, I'll make it two. I'll make it quick also. Um, so the two are know yourself. And the second is uh, being willing to embrace change. So, so what do I mean about know yourself? I think a lot of what I've heard here is, is the same thing. It's, it's having that confidence, but understanding where your strength lies. And how do you apply that strength? Something I realized I was able to do as this woman liberal arts major in a sea of male technical people was that I could take technical issues and I could translate them into normal speak. No offense to all you technical people, but sometimes the importance of what you've got to say gets lost because you can't get from point A to point B quickly without a lot of jargon. And I was able to do that. And that really was advantageous when you were to go down to a policymaker. And it was a skill that, as an intelligence analyst, you have to have. You have to tell the policymaker the so what. It can't just be delivering a fact, a technical capability of a weapons system or something like that. It's what does that techni cap technical capability give to an adversary? What is, and then they can think about what does that mean for us on the receiving end? How are we going to counter that? How can we repel that? That's one thing. Secondly is being willing to embrace change. And I think in today's environment, um, I can't think of any other time in history that you're going to need to be able to embrace change. And, and for me, walking away from Soviet issues was was groundbreaking. I mean, this was, as I told you, I was a child of the Cold War. I was watching for my dad to stop, start building a fallout shelter. And for me to walk away from that and step into Middle East issues was a, was a big change. But it was one that I was glad I embraced, because when the wall fell, and Congress, in its infinite wisdom, and do apologies for anyone here from the Hill, in its infinite wisdom said, oh, no more Soviet Union. You don't need the money anymore. We're cutting your budgets, and uh, you're going to be cutting your Soviet experts. And there were a lot of Soviet experts that were left scrambling to recreate themselves. And I had already done that. And I did that because I was willing to embrace that change. And I continued to do that in my career. And I think as a result, I had a very rewarding and very impactful career. Great. Indeed, you did, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> OK. so. Um, embracing change, since uh, actually your first one was, was one of mine as well, because as an engineer, I actually loved English. I can still diagram a sentence. And I think I'm a pretty good communicator. So I was also able to you know, bridge that divide and 
actually just going back a little bit to the question, um, the, the other question, that was always a kind of a stereotypical, if you're an engineer, A, you're an introvert, introvert B, you can't write, and you certainly can't speak. So <laughs> that was something I was always overcoming. Um, so other hidden superpowers, I, I would say one that is, in my view, extremely important is plays well with others. Mm -hmm. You know, just being able to work with anyone, being able to get along with anyone, being able to adapt skill sets as you're putting a team together, as you're a part of a team, is really important. I mean, yes, hone your skill and be an individual top performer, but we don't succeed when we're performing individually. We succeed when we are really pulling together as a team. And so being able to do that, liking that, knowing when to step forward and lead, knowing when to step back and follow, those are really important skills that I think help anyone and certainly have helped me throughout my career. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, we're going to do audience questions in just a minute, but to, uh, to give you some time to think, uh, lightning question for the panel. So uh, in her book, The H Spot, The Feminist Pursuit of Happiness, Jill Filipovich talks about the importance of satisfying work for women. What in your professional life has brought you joy? And I'll start with Tish, if you're ready. Yeah, um, I think what has brought me the most joy is to see the women and men that I have mentored be successful. Um, being the first woman to run a major intelligence agency in the community, dream come true. Not being the last, because we've already had another major. And so for me, it's just, it's just so rewarding when I look out and see folks that I've worked with and mentored or just had a cup of coffee with and seeing them blossom in their careers or at an INSA mentoring event, when I look around and see the mentors at the tables are folks I mentored years ago, that's, that's what it's about for me. I just have to echo what um, Tish said, when I look back on my career, it's, it's the people, I can, I can distinctively think of one, uh, one relationship uh, with someone who was really struggling. And um, the senior leadership's attitude was, um, nope, not going to make it. And I said, you know what, I think there are other issues going on here. Uh, we've, I really want us to focus on those issues. Um, a person is now a GS-15 and very successful and very, um, and very active and productive member of the intelligence community. And so I, I agree with you, Tish. It's, it's about how much do you invest in the future of this organization? Um, the, the fact is you sitting out there are going to take care of us <laughs> now that we've retired because you're taking care of the country. Taking care of the country. Yeah. yeah. I have to echo those remarks too. Um, for me, it's, it's seeing qualified women rising to leadership, leadership positions. Even within the last decade, I've, I've, my career so far has been a decade, span two agencies, it's pretty small, uh, narrow focus. But I've noticed that there's just been a systemic change from automatically assuming a young female as an administrative assistant to pour coffee, <laughs> mm -hmm. or there to do menial tasks like copying, um, to actually understanding that they have more to offer, um, that they are equally, if not more capable, especially at some of the, the soft skills, the communication building, um, the relationship uh, elements, and, and just being able to bring people, coalesce people together um, to create those uh, teaming working environments is, is really rewarding and for me um, even within the last five years at my current uh, in an essay at my home um, 
I've seen a shift from 30% women leadership leaders in my leadership organization to now about 60%. So women are promoting other women, and it's, it's just incredible to watch and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So there, there are three things. Um, I like to see mission impact, right? I get excited, excite, excited over working towards something and actually having that impact. So if it is winning an opportunity to serve the IC, or if it's advising a client on a very tough, challenging diversity and inclusion, issue or hire to re uh, retire matter. I like to actually see the impact. Number two, I get professional joy about learning new things every day. So I talked a little bit about that opportunity that was granted me to go into the terrorism world, but I learned so much. I was exposed to so much. Right now, I take the opportunity every single week I have a folder on my laptop that's called a knowledge folder. And I look at things within, I'm at McKinsey, there's a wealth of information. So I believe you don't just give to an organization, you also look at how you can gain insights and grow. And so every single week, I kind of tap into my knowledge folder and I'm reading up on you know, digital or, uh, automation uh, that affects diversity and inclusion, um, hire to retire, the future workforce of the IC. These are things that I'm passionate about, so growing new things. Number three, giving back. Every week, my EA knows that I have a block for mentoring. There are some mm -hmm. people right here today that I have met with you for coffee or for lunches to really talk about mentoring and, and how to move the needle. I'm very, very passionate, extremely passionate about how do we move the needle on women and men of color in the IEC. When I look at the audience right now, we are moving the needle some from where we were last year, and that's exciting. And I like to think that those coffees, those lunchings, those meetings, mm -hmm. those hallway discussions, that I've had some type of impact, even if it's just a little, so that gives me professional joy. Mm. Terrific, thank you. All right, uh, I wanna see if there are questions from the audience, and I'll start over here. If there are any. Okay. No? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, Manas Taliarkin again, Northrop Grumman. Um, so the stereotypes that you talk about with engineers coming from an engineering background, um, some of them are, are true. I have actually witnessed both in college and sometimes on the job, there's this pride of being an engineer and that sometimes crosses the line into this unjustified elitism, um, that, which is, yeah, you can learn from anybody, an admin, a technical writer, everybody. Um, is there something along your career path that someone else did to help you feel more included and maybe that's something we can do on our end to try to bridge the gap and make a more collaborative environment where everyone's valued? Thank you. So, so oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So the one thing that I love is uh, something that Tish mentioned, no one person can do it alone, right? And so I've always thought about groupthink, right? And, and I think when you bring teams together and you deliberately bring teams with diverse views, diverse understandings, even if sometimes they contradict, it really helps to bring new thoughts to the table and enlightens others, right? Because if you have this elitist mentality and someone comes in and challenges that, and it's a really good point, it kind of brings you down a notch. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Just a quick thought on that is, to, I mean, it's interesting you talk about this sense of elitism or pride. I think you'll find in Washington, information is power, knowledge is power. And I think we've got to get beyond that. And so for that perspective, I think it's really important for someone who has very deep technical expertise to make it approachable for someone who doesn't. I'll give you an example. I was down in one of my jobs, I ended up touring um, the U.S. Uh, reactor that produced the first fissile material for the first uh, nuclear weapon. And I didn't understand how you went from graphite, natural graphite, uh, excuse me, natural uranium into plutonium. And I turned to one of my colleagues from CIA and I said, how does that work? And he gave me this very technical blah, 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 blah. 
And I just, you know, I just was totally deflated. I, I went to a scientist from DOE and I said, how, how do you go from yellow cake to plutonium? And he explained it to me in a way that I could understand and bridged, and bridged the gap. So, and I think the same thing has to happen if you're on the other side and you're the liberal arts major and you have to be able to explain where this all fits into policy or, or if you're ha you have that information, how you are going to use that information to both ad advance what the organization is doing but, but to help the person with the engineering background. I just want to follow up on one thing you said, Leslie, and that is, you know, knowledge is is power in this town. For those of us who were not from the CIA, we always like to say that shared knowledge is power. Yes. <laughs> As we were trying to get information. <laughs> this was back before information sharing was really in vogue. So sorry. Shared, shared shared knowledge, shared information. Yes. That's true power. Right. And that's where it, it takes the team. It takes everyone working together. In alignment with that, we all have individual strengths, and teaming is essential to generate a robust solution mm -hmm. for any sort of problem that we're facing. So having that open-mindedness and that willing to discuss at all levels. Um, I, I work day to day with the technical team at the national laboratories. Uh, I oversee several programs that um, are ongoing there in very specialized areas that are important. Um, and they do have to break down some of the finite elements of their research to me. But in turn, I, I am able to better communicate that forward mm -hmm. to congressional staffers and senior leaders who are the ones that are funding the continued research to further develop the development. So being willing to have that communication and open-minded um, to, to just better understanding and hearing each other mm -hmm. is really what it's all about. Thanks. The question over here. There we go. Hi, I'm Amanda Brownfield. Um, I graduated from Duke University with a degree in political science, as Maisha knows, and a minor in religion. And in the Army's infinite wisdom, I was branched Corps of Engineers. <laughs> I then spent 15 years at a company that was very operationally focused with Maisha. And then she and I together went to a company that was what we called a bunch of nerdy engineers. <laughs> so uh, somehow, through all of that, I managed to succeed without any sort of formal technical training. But since there are a lot of uh, students in the room today, the question uh, that I have is, is there something that younger people or people early in their careers, uh, technical training or certificates or things that they should pursue to sort of complement that traditional liberal arts degree? Good answers. Yeah, I guess. Um, one thing that I see that is really different from when I went off to college to go get an engineering degree is just the amount of technology in our everyday lives. And so, I mean, I think anyone has a huge step up on, you know, someone of, and I'll just say someone of my generation, again, because the amount of technology that it, it is just a natural part of, of what we do um, day in and day out. And I think there are a lot more opportunities for young women and young men growing up when you think about girls who code and um, all of the, the camps that exist today um, that do develop some of the more technical or harder skills. And I'm not sure, you know, we talk hard skills, soft skills. I gotta tell you, soft skills are every bit as, if not even more important than, you know, those, those technology skills. Because if you can't communicate what it is you're trying to get across, all the knowledge in the world um, doesn't really matter. So I'm not really answering your question directly on you know, certificate programs or things like that. I mean, certainly, you know, for the students who are out there, and and I always like to look at the well-rounded, which is why I tried to, you know, take theater classes and um, 
continue my French and history and geography, you know, as an engineering student, is yeah, look for some of those classes to add to um, your uh, your curricula while you're in school. And then there are a lot of certificate opportunities. There are a lot of continuing education uh, opportunities as you know, after you graduate and, and you're out working. And I dare say, your companies um, will probably make that investment um, in you as well. So, so look for what your companies offer or what your government organizations offer because there are just a wealth of training and education opportunities out there. Yeah, I, would, I would echo that. I, uh, when I started at um, CIA, they had a, a lengthy like three week class that was for uh, touring different parts of the defense industrial base. I, I mean, I watched submarine production. I saw, you know, artillery production. I toured missile production facilities. And I think that cooperation between the private and the public sector is, is very, very important. And I, I don't know if that course still exists. It may not. That kind of thing is very expensive. But I think that kind of thing is what we really need to help. Like you say, technology is changing, and it's so cutting edge just to keep, to keep uh, government employees on the front end of that. For the students, I would say identify what drives you. What's your passion? And naturally gravitate toward it. And identify a mentor to talk to about particular courses that might be able to help aid your understanding in that field. But um, I, I think that's first and foremost, is, is really, truly sticking with, with what makes you tick. And, and what gives you purpose every day. Um, for me, that's nuclear. Uh, and there are some classes for me for nuclear physics and engineering, but those are very niche courses, and, and you wouldn't find those very readily available to the open population. But um, just identifying somebody in that field to, to just talk to and have that conversation. If, if you tell them what your interests are, more than likely they'll help promote you and put you places that will help create those opportunities for you to succeed. An additional um, option is think of uh, growing as, as a social aspect, right? So instead of a task, something that you must do, how do you kind of incorporate it into your everyday life? So for the students, I would say, I remember when I was a student, I would gravitate towards the conferences, events, um, and the friends that did the same things, right? So if we were liberal arts majors, we would go to those types of conferences and we would do it together because it was fun. We did it as a group. So I would say stretch yourself and go to an event with some other friends that are on the STEM side and go to some of those conferences and events because with exposure comes knowledge. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit of a comment with a question to go with it is that um, I've done some work with universities like uh, in Boulder, Colorado, the Atlas Institute where the colleges themselves are taking the engineering schools and the liberal arts and, and creating new degrees. They started with PhDs and moved back to masters. When they saw the success of women became 75% of their applicants because once they involved the liberal arts pieces with the engineer courses, it was huge. And women loved it and their passion went. So now they're starting to build just regular majors around it. I think Stanford's doing it too. Um, so there's a few colleges, and I guess my question would be, since we're seeing success in that, it brings a lot more diversity and it combines the skills. What could we do, Like, and are we maybe, Tish, I have no idea, what are we doing within the intelligence community to affect that they continue to actually have you know, a BS in STEAM. Like, I used to try to influence it when I was on the board from an innovative perspective because it was a lot of startups in Boulder and things like that, but how we could have a huge impact on saying, hey, journalism's going down, those schools are kind of shutting down, we could use those kind of minds in our uh, intel analysts with the engineering skills, how about we help you create a course, you know? Um, 
I think that would be really beneficial for our community. Well, there, there is certainly the Intelligence Community Centers of Academic Excellence program. Um, for those of you who are not aware of it, there are grants that the intelligence community gives to colleges and universities across the U.S. to develop, to help them develop curricula that is of interest to the intelligence community. Lenore Gant was instrumental in starting that program when she was um, in the intelligence community and are probably still involved now at Howard University with the work that, that she's doing now. Um, I honestly don't know if any of that work is really directed at the marriage you know, of, of STEM and liberal arts, but I will tell you, sitting on the Board of Visitors of Virginia Tech, my alma mater, we are very focused um, in that as a higher education institution in really looking at the full experience for a student, for, for students to be deep, and, and we talk about this in the intelligence community, deep in your area of expertise, but also understanding the social aspects, the social implications of, of what it is you are doing and how you can be a better citizen of the world. So I do know that universities are focused on that. I, I honestly don't know, and, and maybe someone else does, and I'd encourage you to, to, to speak up, whether there is a demand signal um, being given from the intelligence community today. I'm a, a, just a little away from it. Yep, so uh, I think that is a great conversation to continue in your, the lunch networking hour. <laughs> so one, uh, <laughs> one final question for, for you all, quick answer. What tangible piece of advice would you like to give the audience? And we'll start with Leslie. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> um, don't, don't give up. I mean, if you have a dream and you have a passion, um, when I got out of graduate school, I couldn't find a job. I took home $300 every two weeks. I was working as a salesperson in a store in Georgetown Park. I made ends meet as a seamstress on the side. $300 a week, two, every two weeks is not a lot, but I kept going, and you can too. Rachel? So I'll end with a statistic. According to a 2016 study by the American Association of uh, American Colleges and Universities, 93% of employers agree that a demonstrated capacity to think critically, communicate clearly, and solve complex problems is more important than one's undergraduate major. So my advice is in alignment with that. The ability to effectively communicate your solution and the process by which you derived it outweighs any material or immaterial difference between educational backgrounds. I would say focus on the mission. Focus on the impact that you can have on the mission. Whatever the mission it is, be it if you're in the industry, if you're in the government, that's what the IC needs. Focus on that, identify the gaps, and that's where you can create your opportunity. Fish? And to say something different, pay it forward. Yeah. Help yeah. one another. Again, we succeed as, as a team. So pay it forward. With that, uh, I'll close. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much for your gracious time and um, your thoughtful responses. One last piece of business. Um, I'm plugging the uh, mid-career reboot breakfast. This room, July 22nd, break out your calendars, write it down now. Um, <laughs> go ahead, I don't see anybody writing. No, um, <laughs> so this is a, an Intelligence Champions Council uh, initiative to help target those mid-career professionals and think about what they can do to help reboot, to deepen, or take a different career path. And so we look forward to having you back here in the morning, bright and early, July 22nd, co-sponsored by USGIF. Thank you. And uh, we are looking forward to it. So thank you so much. Mark your calendars.
I think it's live, there we go. Thank you, Cameron, and all the panelists for that lively conversation. I'm glad that Cameron mentioned the July mid-career reboot. Cameron is the vice chair of the Intelligence Champions Council, something he did not share with you, so he has some more hard work ahead of him. And along those lines, many of you all are familiar with our annual INSA Achievement Awards that we hold every February, where we recognize six extraordinary future leaders of the intelligence community. I would encourage you all, in several months when the nomination period is launched that you all consider someone who you have mentored or someone who has been a mentee of yours um, to nominate for that event. It's an extremely uplifting evening and we're proud to be hosting it again next February. We'll also be hosting our William Oliver Baker Award on June 14th. Registration is still open for that event and I would encourage you to check out the evening online. A um, couple things I wanted to mention logistically. Box lunches are available out here in the foyer. Last year we had a plated luncheon, which was lovely in a panel, but we had some feedback on the survey last year that folks wanted a little more time for networking, and so we're looking forward to providing you that during lunch. And then we have a, a challenge today, which is sometimes unusual when we use this room for other events, but there seems to be a longer line at the ladies' restroom than the men's restroom. So I have the pleasure of letting you all know you can take the elevator here or in the foyer up to nine, and there'll be a female intern standing by to plug in the code so you all can use the facilities <laughs> on, on floor number nine. So somebody will be up there for the next 15 or 20 minutes. If you choose to go up there, we, we welcome you to do so. And then I look forward to reconvening here at 1245. Thanks again to all the panelists and Cameron. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so it good to great. see you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I thank was going to.